Well, it's uh, an immense pleasure for me to welcome you to this special colloquium inserted in the webinar series of the Graduate Program in Physics of the Federal University of Pará in Amazonia, Brazil. I ask everyone to kindly leave the microphone and the camera turn it off, except for the moment you're going to speak. Questions will be allowed in the end, unless otherwise requested by the speaker. The questions can be asked using the chat, both in this room and in YouTube. Today, uh, we have the great honor to listen to Professor Rainer Weiss, who was awarded with the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics, together with Barry Barish and Kip Thorne, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Professor Rainer, was, Professor Rainer Weiss was born in Berlin, and after schooling in New York, Professor Weiss studied in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the MIT, in the United States of America where he's, he received his Bachelor in Science in 1955 and PhD in 1962. After a couple of years at Tufts University and Princeton University, he returned to the MIT, where he has been associated with ever since. Professor Wise is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Physical Society, Physical Society the American Academy of Arts and Science, and he's a member of the American Astron Astronomical Society. Presently, our special guest is Professor of Physics Emeritus at the MIT. Apart from the Nobel Prize in Physics, Professor Weiss' research has been honored with numerous prizes and recognitions, including the Médaille de la Dion Observatoire de Nice in France in 2003, Robert Prize in Cosmology both in 2006 and 2016, the Einstein Prize from the APS in 2007, Shaw Prize in Astronomy and the Claudie Prize in Astrophysics, both in 2016, the Willis Lamb Award for Laser Science and Quantum Optics in 2017, as I said, among and many others. The beginning of gravitational wave astronomy, some results, and a little about the future, is what Professor Weiss will tell us about today. And I should not make you wait longer to listen to him. Professor Rainer Weiss. Thank you very much once again for having accepted our invitation. We are honored. From this moment on, the audience is yours. Well, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here. And, and I, I have never been involved with Brazil much, except that I have some colleagues in, in, in Brazil who are in the same field, and you probably know some of them, who have also tried and made advances in what we're going to be talking about. So uh, since... Uh, since I think they are part of something called the LIGO, collab the LIGO scientific collaboration. I don't know, I can't find them on this thing, but they are part of this collection of people, of about 60 organizations that have been involved in the research you're gonna hear about. And about, about a thousand people are in this, in this collaboration. All have contributed significantly to what you're gonna hear. So uh, let me get started by with something which I hope most of you know. Here's, here's Isaac Newton, and uh, we know him well for something which is very important down here, namely the formula that relates his vision of how gravity works. And it really is a universal expression. It turns out that was what really was very important on the part of, 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 of Newton. He realized that this expression, which we're gonna be talking about in a second, applies not only on the Earth, between, let's say, apples and the ground, but also between the moon and the earth and the sun and the earth and so forth. That it was really something, this was a very big step forward in science, namely to associate something which is, is in the heavens with something that is on the earth itself. It was really dramatic. And what does it say? Well, it tells you that the force between two masses, M1 and M2, is proportional to a constant, which is unimportant, but it's a number, uh, but it gets weaker and weaker as the square of the distance. Now, it turns out this does beautifully to explain most of the things that we deal with in gravity. It explains the tides. It explains just what I said before, how the, how the planetary systems work. It fails in a little tiny bit in the, the way that planetary systems works, but people didn't realize that in the beginning, and that has to do with the planet Mercury. But we'll get to that. Anyway, there's no good reason not to use this law, and it works for even spacecraft and everything else. So 
but here I do want to talk about something which doesn't include in in the in the uh, Newton theory, and that is somehow information about gravity moves around in Newton's theory with almost infinite speed. If anybody thought about it at the time of Newton, he they would have said, well, there's no delay, there's nothing, there's nothing complicated about it. But it turns out there is. And the gentleman who actually had a completely different view of this is Albert Einstein. Here he is at a time which is a good bit later than when he invented the theory we're going to talk about. But his relationship to gravity is this equation right here. Now, this looks like a deceptively simple equation. It's a stinker. It's very, very hard to solve this equation. And people are only in the last 10 years able to solve this at, at the places where you need to solve it uh, on a computer. It's, that's called numerical relativity. But what does this equation tell us? It tells us that the, that the way you measure the geometry of space and time is somehow related to the distribution of energy and mass. That's this. So space and time are determined by the way energy and mass are distributed. That's a completely different layout, completely different vision of the way gravity works. And I'll try to give you a little idea about this by showing you a thing which isn't perfect, but it gives you some of idea so you can think about it. Here is a, in New York, we have things that kids play in called jungle gyms. And these are things which are just parallel bars that you can erect. And so you may, they're called monkey bars. And you're going to walk around in them. There are parallel bars in three dimensions that meet. And kids jump inside of, inside of it. And what is this is sort of a cut through the jungle gym, a, a two-dimensional cut through the jungle gym. And you can see uh, out here, far away from this object, which is the sun, and here's the earth, that this, the space of the jungle gym is very much like you would expect the way you, bought, the way you built it. It's rectangular and square and straight, and everything is fine. And as you get closer to these heavy things, like the sun and the earth, the space gets distorted by the mass of the sun. And in fact, it gets curved. And there's a little bit of dimple like that also for the earth. You can see here's the earth. And there the space is not as severely distorted, but it's distorted. There's another feature which is not in the picture. And that is just as important, but it's hard to draw. And that is that if you put clocks you know, good clocks at each point where there's an intersection of the bars, like here, there, everywhere there is. It's like an expensive thing to do, but it's worthwhile to, so you can understand this. You'll find an interesting thing out, that as you look at the clocks out here, they all read the same time at the same moment of time. But as you walk toward this place where the curvature of space is quite large, you will also find out that the clocks are going more slowly. They're going more slowly than the clocks out here. And that's actually an important thing. Otherwise, and this is the place where nowadays you would know that Einstein is probably the right theory because many of you probably have GPS receivers in your telephones or in your cars, and they would not work if you did not account for the fact that the clocks go at a different rate in a, in a weak field far away from the Earth where these, where these, where the, transmitters are for the GPS, the clocks are going more quickly than near the on the Earth, where you have your little handheld device. And if you didn't take account for that difference in the t way time is kept, you wouldn't come home to the right place. You go probably on sort of probably half a mile away. It depends how, how, how far you are, but half a mile away from where you live. And, and so it's a, an important effect. So in this new theory, you have distortion of space and time. And the distortion is due to mass and energy. And on top of that, you also have a information that travels in this space, which are called gravitational waves, which I'll show you in a minute. And that is something which is what we're going to be talking about as a thing that was the discovery of the experiment. So let me go on. Here at first now is then let me first talk to you a little bit about uh, the gravitational waves. And so you can imagine what a gravitational wave looks like and the, what it might do. First of all, the sources of gravitational waves are very much like in electricity and magnetism, where you think of in electricity and magnetism, you think of the sources of the electromagnetic waves as being due to acceleration of charges. That's also true in, in, in this Einstein theory. It's acceleration of mass 
that makes the gravitation waves. But it's not all kinds of acceleration, especially non-spherically symmetric accelerations. In other words, two things crashing into each other will make gravitation waves, or two things orbiting each other will make gravitation waves. But uh, a, a, a ball that oscillates uniformly, so it's changing its radius, and continually changing its radius, getting smaller and bigger, which is truly accelerated, will not make gravitational waves. So that's an important distinction. It's in E and M, electricity and magnetism, that distinction is there too, but it's subtle. So what is the kinematics of these waves? This was guessed at in Einstein's 1916 and 1918 papers, when he was thinking about gravitational waves for the first time. He suggested that they travel at the speed of light. And it turns out, as we'll learn in a few, well, you'll learn in this talk, that we know this now for a fact, and it's remarkably good. It's a remarkably good uh, guess that Einstein made. And the waves themselves are transverse waves. They're very much like E and M waves in that regard. But they're also like water waves. And uh, what is that they, what the waves are, a, they are a strain in space. And I'll show you this with this set of dots. Imagine that you're standing right here in the middle of this where there's a red square. And these dots are, let's think of them as little masses that have been sp sprinkled into space. And a gravitational wave is coming at you out of, the, out of, your, out of your screen. So let's see if I can make this go. Yes, good. If you can see that, you'll see an interesting motion. First thing you'll notice is that right where I told you you are standing, nothing much is happening. But there's all sorts of stuff going on around you. For example, if in one direction, the space is being stretched at simultaneously as in the other direction, space is being compressed. Stretched in one dimension, compressed in the other perpendicular to the direction in which the gravitational wave is moving. So that's the transverse nature of the thing. But what is a strain? The strain is interesting. What it is is this. You'll notice that the dots that are very far from you, here you are, again, standing in the middle. And you look out here at this very distant dot. It's moving a lot compared to that dot that's very close to you. And so it turns out this is exactly the same kind of picture you would make if you took a piece of rubber a rubber band in your hand and had your friend of yours, as you put the hand, you hold the rubber band and stretch your hands and have a friend of you mark, oh, every quarter of a centimeter, mark a, a little line on it. And then you watch the motion as you stretch the rubber band. And you'll notice it's exactly like that. It turns out that the field quantity in this case is the space is stretching and compressing with a thing that's called a strain. In other words, the change in position of these, the change in position of this dot is proportional to the relative that dot is proportional to the separation of the dots to begin with. In other words, the quantity, that's the strain, is delta L, the change in position, divided by the separation. Okay. <coughs> the first person to try to measure this was a guy named Joseph Weber. I mean, Einstein had come up with the theory himself very worried about the theory. A lot of people worried about it for many years. But Weber was the first person to really think, well, maybe you ought to be able to see these things. And he devised an experiment uh, at the University of Maryland where he took a great big bar of aluminum and uh, he was hoping that a gravitational wave will come perpendicular like that picture and stretch the bar, let's say, in this dimension while it contracts it in that dimension. He was hoping that would happen from some astrophysical event. And he mounts a little strain gauges that measure the strain directly on the bar. And he takes this whole thing and sticks it in this vacuum set chamber and closes it up. By the way, the Brazilian scientists who are working in this area were working on something similar to this, but much, much, much more sophisticated. They were looking at us. This, this system that was a great big sphere. And if the sphere expanded uniformly, I mean, the sphere expanded. That makes it sensitive to gravitational waves coming from all directions. This bar is sensitive to mostly to, the, to, the, to things coming that coming either from above or from from the side, but not not along uh, not along this direction. Not any. It's not uniform in, in in sensitivity. Well, all right. To to Weber's unfortunate circumstance, what happened is he built this, 
And by 1969, he had three of these running, one in the University of Maryland, another one in a golf course not too far from the uh, university, and in Chicago, which is in the middle of the United States. And he had seen, now in those same bars, three detectors, he saw coincident events that stretched the bar at, at all three places. And he thought the best way to explain that is by saying that he had discovered gravitational waves. And he wrote a paper, a very important paper in the field in 1969, which was read by everybody. It was in the physical review letters. And, but it was not such a hard experiment. This is not a super hard experiment to do. And so a lot of people in the world do what physicists do. They said, hey, we'd like to get in. We want to see this for ourselves. And that's where the trouble started. It turned out that nobody else who had built a thing like this saw gravitational waves. And that started a bad arguments and all sides thought such ideas that maybe this was bad physics. It's unfortunate because Weber, Weber should have been a little more careful, but he had a very interesting and good idea to try to do this. So another idea came along to do this with light. And uh, that's what LIGO is built on. And let me explain that to you. What's going on in this picture, which will be also a, a, a little animation in a minute, is that here's a laser. Of course, it doesn't look like a laser, but the laser, and it'll send out a light that's red and send it to this device, which is a beam splitter, which is a device that lets half the light transmit and half the light reflect. So it's a 50 50% of the light goes, goes through it, and 50% of the light gets reflected. And then in that light goes to these, this mirror, comes back again to the beam splitter, as the same happens here, it goes to that mirror gets reflected by this beam splitter, and the light may or may not, depending on how it's phased, will get to this detector. And so let me start this so you can see what's going on. A gravitational wave will come in in a minute and stretch that space, the way the, the space was stretched by the dots. OK, here's a reflection from that mirror coming back to the beam splitter and the of reflection. And you notice no light is going to the photodetector. The two waves cancel each other. And because the paths are exactly equal on these two arms, now comes a gravitational wave which stretches one and, con and, and contracts the other. And when those paths are no longer equal, light goes to the photodetector. That is, in fact, the basis of the whole idea of LIGO. And it's no more than that. I mean, there are lots of tricks and have to be done to see this. But the idea that when you set up a thing that's called a Michelson interferometer like that and make the path lengths equal between the mirror and the beam spitter on the two arms, they will give you no light at all when those times are identical. And, that's the, and what happens is the gravitational wave disturbs that. It makes one arm take a little longer to send the light than the other. OK. So that's all very well until you run into Kip Thorne. Here's Kip back in about, the, I don't know, middle 70s. And he has been st studying with his group uh, what, how big does that strain have to be? So how, how big can it be if it comes from astrophysical sources? And he comes up with a very dire number. He says here, H is the symbol that's used for that. And here's that ratio of change in length divided by the length. And Kip and others, but Kip mostly, is who did a lot of thinking about this, says you've got to be able to measure strains of 10 to the minus 21 if you're going to succeed with this and detect any astrophysical sources. Well, let's put that into context. It's a terribly small number. Well, if you have L being 4 kilometers, which is what LIGO is, the change in length that's associated with that would be about 4 times 10 to the minus 18 meters. That's one thousandth the size of a nucleus in an atom, over four kilometers. And that was considered very, very difficult by almost everybody, and they were right. And I'll give it to you in a nice way to say it. You were measuring changes in the length that were parts in 10 to the 12 of a wavelength, if you were going to succeed with this, of light. In other words, you had to somehow measure the wavelength to parts in 10 to the 12, or measure the, the length change by 10 to the minus 12 of a wavelength of light. So that was hard, but it was not impossible. The thing that really was hard was this one. 
Namely, you also had to make sure that those mirrors that you saw in that little animation were not vibrating due to other reasons in gravitational waves. And for example, right at the Earth's surface, where you're now sitting, and maybe, I don't know, I think Para is near the ocean, so it's a little worse than this. But the amount of motion of the ground in at, let's say, frequencies like one hertz is 10 to the minus 12 of this number. In other words, if you, it's, it's, excuse me, it's, it's, 10 to, it's 10 to the 12 times, sorry, let me say it carefully. The motion of the Earth is about one micron, a few microns, 10 to the minus six of uh, meters of motion. That's what your, your room is shaking up and down by 10 to the minus six meters. That means in order to get to 10 to the minus 18, you have to build some sort of isolation system that isolates to 10 to the minus 12 of the Earth's motion. That was really hard. So here's the way the, the detector was made that actually did the measurement. Uh, and this is the one that actually made, and now I'll walk you through this one. You know a little about this already. Here's the laser that you were familiar with from the other animation. Here's that beam splitter. And over here are those mirrors that were reflecting the light to the, okay, those two mirrors. And then you also had a detector there. Now here, what, here's what's going on. All these extra things make it so that you get sensitivity. For example, this mirror right there, which wasn't in the animation, is partially reflecting. And what it causes is the light to bounce back and forth many times in here. So the time that the light spends interacting with a gravitational wave is very much longer than it was without that mirror there. That's how exactly the same thing happens on this side. And that optical cavity, it's a fabry pro cavity, you make it so that the time the light spends in the arms is also exactly equal in these two arms. That makes it very much the same as what we were having before. And, uh, and then here is the detector. Now, what is this, this mirror right now is, a, again, a partial mirror. What does it do? In the thing we, sh we showed you, if you make the time the light spends in this arm and in that arm identical, no light goes to the photo detector. Well, where does the light go? The light goes right back to the, to the laser. That's bad. And in order to keep the light from hitting the laser, what you put another mirror in here, which does something very elegant. It takes the light that comes back from the interferometer and interferes it with the light that ref is reflected from, from that mirror the laser light that's reflected from that mirror. So here are the two beams that interfere. One that goes through that mirror and another one that's reflected by that mirror. And you can make them interfere so no light goes back to the laser. When you do that, an awful lot of light builds up in here. In that you might have a 10, might have a, a 20 watt laser here. You might have two th to three kilowatts of light circulating in this. And you might have a half a megawatt of light going up back and forth in here. Now, this extra mirror is a little subtle. What that does is it takes the information that is put on the light by the gravitational wave and sends it back into the interferometer. And we'll talk, you could ask me questions about that later. It's, it, it's, it, it was used in the, in the detector that made the detection. Um, so here then is the noises. These are, what's plotted here is the, equivalent strain noise, that's H of F, meaning how much noise at each frequency is allowed. And so this is strain per square root of frequency. Complicated system, it's an amplitude of noise. And here is the frequency. So by the way, here is, uh, so yeah, so you can, let me go stay, go back to this. This spectral density, if you wanna convert that to the 10 to the minus 21, for example, let's say here at this very minimum point of the noise, which we'll get to, that's about a few times 10 to the minus 23, uh, or strain per root hertz. If you multiply that by the square root of the frequency, which is about 10, because you're at 100 hertz, you get an, an RMS strain, a root mean square strain of about 10 to the minus 22. So this detector was a little better than what Kip said we needed, okay? And uh, here are the different things that, these are the noise terms that limit the performance. It's this yellow curve right in here is the area where you could detect. And this is, this limit is due to the fact that you have fi finite number of photons. And in fact, we call that the quantum noise. And that's, if you increase the amount of light, this noise will go down. 
but at the expense of increasing what's called the radiation pressure noise, which right now isn't playing much of a role. If you put more and more light in and bring this down, this part of the curve starts going up. So you got to, there's a game you have to play eventually. The other limiting curve right here is the fact that everything is at room temperature. And uh, that's something that the group in, in, in Brazil avoided by going to liquid helium temperature. And uh, so what, but we're living at room temperature. And so everything shakes a little bit due to the fact that it's warm. And that has a little bit of noise that limits it right around a very important region in the first detector. And then lastly, the fact that you can't completely get rid of that seismic noise. You already have done very well with HAP. It's much, much bigger than any of this, but you've tried the best you can, and that limits it at the very lowest frequencies. So uh, there is a noise I want to tell you about, which it does, doesn't look like anything in this picture. It's hardly of any consequence. But it becomes very, very consequent if you want to detect gravitational waves at low frequencies. And that's something that's going to be going on in the epoch in the next 10 years. And in fact, <clears throat> that noise is a, I'll just say what it is because it's important for you to know. What it is is the fact that those mirrors that you have hanging in, the, in, in that interferometer <clears throat> respond to the fact that there are density fluctuations in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is not uniform and the ground is not uniform, even though the ground is accelerating and making all this terrible seismic noise, there's another noise it makes. The fact is, it's through, just straight through Newton, that Newton equation you saw in the very first slide. When the ground changes density, the density fluctuations pull on the mirror, just like the density fluctuations in the atmosphere pull on the mirror. So this noise you can't get rid of. You've got to get off the Earth to do that, and that's what is being done to get at lower, lower frequencies. That's why I want to point that out to you. Okay, let's go. So here now is the uh, disposition of the various detectors around the world. In the United States, there are two detectors. One that they're both four kilometers long, one in the Pacific Northwest, and another one in Louisiana. And uh, then there's another detector that's about three kilometers long in near Pisa in Italy. And then there's a research a detector that's about 600 meters long. Unfortunately, that's not sensitive enough to detect gravitational waves, but they have performed a lot of research on how to make this instrument better at this, short, this smaller detector. And just coming onto the air a year ago is an Italian, is a, is a um, Japanese detector called Kagra, which is built into the mine where the neutrino detectors are. And the detector is being built in India. Now, uh, which is built like LIGO, four kilometers. So why so many detectors? You'll see as we get to the science that you need many detectors to figure out where the gravitational wave sources that you are detecting really are. We'll get back to that when, uh, when, when we get to what things we've discovered. So here's a little tour of the LIGO lab. Looking, this is looking down on the, so on the detector in Louisiana. And uh, this should move a little bit. Yeah, this is looking down on the one in the Pacific Northwest. And here's that concrete envelope that holds a vacuum tube inside of it. And there the laser beams run back and forth. Here's the, the highly evacuated tube that's inside that concrete cover. And here's a standard laser table and optics table, like any lab you would have in, in PARA. And here is the control room for the uh, LIGO system and with people learning how to run the detector. Okay, here is the actual performance. And this is a slide I want to show only because we're very proud of it. And it shows the hard work that went into the following. This now is the noise. All these different curves are associated with different dates of us working on the, the detector in, in both, uh, in both in Pacific, uh, Pacific Northwest and in Louisiana. But what's going on here is you'll notice that here is how well we could measure a meter, a noise in meters, instead of a strain. That's, you can just divide this by 4,000 to get the strain. And uh, so that's, as you go down in this picture, the motion in the detector gets smaller and smaller. In other words, it gets more and more sensitive. And this is, again, frequency. Here's 100, 100 hertz, there's one kilohertz. So you can see what happened. Well, when we started with the whole thing, it was pretty bad. I mean, these are orders of magnitude, each one of these. And little by little, we got things got better. I won't go into all the reasons how we did this, but eventually we got down to here. 
and the the red line is the, the red is the best we got in that first detector and you'll notice something interesting there's a dotted dashed line in there which is what how we predicted the detector should have worked and it did we didn't quite make the sensitivity curve at these low frequencies but we got pretty close to it in fact we got right to it by the time we got to about 70 hertz or 60 hertz uh, the noise that we actually measured and what we predicted was very close we had not detected gravitational waves and we call that a clean non-detection and most people would say well oh that's terrible that's absolutely awful why well, you've spent all that time and you didn't detect anything well it was crucial that we did that because we were able with that whole procedure to realize we had to make improvements and having demonstrated that we could do as well as we calculated with what we thought we would do we were able to get further funding to do the next thing which was called advanced LIGO and the advancements that were made let me say where they were made they specifically addressed this region at low frequencies where things were not as good as they should have been and they were to make a very much more fancy isolation system all the low frequency noise had was due to the seismic noise as you saw in that picture and so we made pendula uh, that multiple pendula if you play a little bit with at home when you go home and you can you can see how a pendulum isolates if a pendulum isolates the high frequency noise if you wiggle make a pendulum hold the, the string up in your right hand and watch the, and put a little weight on the bottom and watch that weight if you're standing still everything's standing still and if you wiggle your hand very very slowly back and forth you'll see that the pendulum bob moves with you but if you wiggle it fast you'll notice that the pendulum bob stands still or almost still so that's what we do you do this that's how you get rid of uh, the noise and so this is done now here once there's this is a mass and that's a spring to make it a little better so this is first pendulum that pendulum is hanging from and this one is hanging from another one and finally here's another this is the one of the precious mirrors but it's hanging from that and then finally the test mass which is the one that's most protected of all is the one at the bottom and thermal noise is reduced also by making these so not wires anymore they're made out of fused silica which is like a glass so all in all this made a big difference this suspension was developed by the, the, Gla the by glasgow the glasgow people scotland and that coupled to a system which i won't describe except to tell you how what it does here is this multiple pendulum system and you can see it in this picture hanging from something else this thing up here is an active vibration isolation system and it works very much like the headphones many people use when they take an airplane ride you have a microphone in those headsets that listens to the airplane noise okay and it can it gets processed and put on the earphone to cancel the noise from the airplane but does not cancel the music that you'd like to hear so this is the same kind of idea what you have is you have an instrument that means that measured the ground noise like a seismometer and you, then you have pushers to push this thing around to cancel the signal that you see in the seismometer. And that's done twice here. There are two stages up in this thing. And that's called an active vibration isolation system. And some of you who have very delicate experiments might be interested in asking LIGO to help you if you're interested in making such a thing. Uh, and because this, this, these two things together were the things that made it possible to make a detection. So what did we see? Well, uh, on the uh, 14th of September, 2015, in the very early morning in Louisiana, we saw, and then also even earlier morning uh, in Hanford, uh, that's the site in, Livingston is the, noir, is the site in southern United States. This is the one in northern United States. We saw something like this. And what this is, we measured strain at a level of 10 to minus 21 as kip was thinking and this is time now this is seconds fractions of seconds and the same thing is going on here at the other site in, in louisiana and most of this is junk this is all noise junk 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 but out of the noise something begins to come out and it's this thing that gets bigger and bigger eventually it's so big that the noise it has noise of a different kind but this is where the signal is and then it goes back to junk well, the same thing looks like it's happening in, 
in Hanford. And here is that same situation. And you can put them on top of each other. And uh, uh, you get not an exact match. This is noise, as I told you. But you, you don't get an exact match because there's still some noise, but it's mostly signal now. And then out here, it's just junk again. And here's an interesting thing that I had to do. You had to take and shift the data, that is the data from uh, Hanford, to make it fit the data from, uh, from Livingston by about seven thousandths of a second, seven milliseconds. And that gave us the first inkling that if this was a gravitational wave, and we were not sure of that, if this were a gravitational wave, it must have come from the south, the southern sky somehow, because it hit Louisiana first, and then seven thousandths of a second later, it hit the Pacific Northwest, going through the Earth. The Earth, the Earth doesn't even see the gravitational waves. It doesn't stop it. Nothing stops it. So that probably was our first thing, and we worried about a lot whether we should publish it. We were very thought about it a lot. Uh, and uh, here's one ways that we were thinking about it. Uh, here is a different way of representing the same signal, uh, and that is uh, as a frequency spectrum. And here, instead, the vertical axis is in frequency. Here is middle C, 256 hertz. And what's over here is a time series. This is a time again. But here's that same time series we saw in the, in the first pictures. And here is a distribution of how much of the signal is at these different frequencies. And when it's bright, it's very much of the signal is at, let's say, 128 hertz. And these two spectra, call them, these call these sonograms or spectra, uh, frequency spectra of the signal were also, and very much important, very important to us as we'll, as you'll see as we go along. Uh, I've made some sounds here, but they may not show up. Let me see, so you can hear this. I don't know if you heard it, but uh, if you did, here's a way of mim. We mix mess the sound up a little bit so you can hear it better. I don't know if you heard it. It's unimportant, but this is more important. This is now a model, and this is no longer an artist's rendition, but this is a model of using the Einstein theory in, with numerical relativity. I mean, solving the Einstein equation that I showed you earlier with the idea that there are two objects going around each other. You can put that into the equation. And then varying parameters, you can solve and see if you get a signal that looks like the signal that we detected. And that's what this is about. Now, this is an animation I'll show you, but it's a computer drawing. It's not an artist's drawing. Down on the bottom here is a time series. And here is this thing that we saw. Where it had been going on for a long, long time before that, and uh, if this theory is right. And uh, here now is the time. And let me start this, and you'll see. Uh, OK, good. Now, what you're seeing here is two black holes going around each other. And these two black holes are on top of that same kind of picture as the jungle gym that I showed you. <clears throat> you show it, the color coding tells you how the time is kept. The time in green is going quickly. Wherever it's red or black, the time has almost stopped. And those little arrows stretching things are the strain in the space. And now you can see slowly but surely something is going to happen. And you'll see this as these two black holes get closer and closer. Uh, they're going to get, they're, they're radiating gravitation waves, as you can see them already. And uh, I, I think that this has gotten slow because of the, oh, OK. Now you have, straw, yeah, whoops, there the time went to hell. And now that you see these two black holes coming together, and they're forming a new black hole with these enormous mountains that have been generated in the curvature of space. And now everything quiets down, and uh, the gravitational waves leave, and this thing keeps radiating. That picture is a pic that makes a waveform that is, if, when you choose the masses properly and the distance right, because you, you, you will get to. I won't let me go on because I'm running out of time. So here's what happened. This is the first of these events. Uh, and uh, then this is the one we've been talking about. Uh, then we saw another event in October of that year. That These things tell you October 12th, 2015. We didn't mark that as a GW because we weren't sure of it. 
Uh, but the first one, so, so we can tell you what we knew a lot, having done that numerical modeling, that the black holes that are associated with this was uh, one of them weighed 36 suns, the other one 29, and three, the energy of three suns was thrown out into space as gravitational waves. It's an unbelievable amount of energy. And the whole universe didn't, the energy that went out for that very short time was more than the whole energy of the entire, you know, optical and R radio and X-ray and gamma ray energy of all the objects in the universe, just for that brief moment. A tremendous amount of energy went into this for very little effect, as you see, 10 to minus 21. So anyway, the next one we saw was this one. And that was a, a day after Christmas as celebrated in the United States in that year. And that was a completely different, with much longer, smaller masses, smaller amount of radiation going off, but it lasted a long time. And this was in our, we set, detected all of that. And that made us believe, well, maybe this one is right, that one is right too. And so we decided to publish. And so, and then we've seen many more since then. The next big event that was, and we now by this time have been seeing many, many black hole events. But a very important one was in, uh, in 2017, in, in August, when Virgo came on the air. That's the detector in Italy. And not only did LIGO see it at these two detectors, but Virgo saw it also. And that was very important for the field because what that allowed us to do is it allowed us to say, here's a, here's a picture of the sky. You know, you make a, make a, where is that source in the sky? And if you had LIGO alone, just like these two detectors alone, you would get an uncertainty that looks like this banana. Huge, probably a thousand square degree, yeah, a thousand square degree uncertainty. And if you want to tell an astronomer, go look in there to see what this was, they would laugh you away. On the other hand, with Virgo together, it gets very much better. You can do a very much better job of timing Virgo now against LIGO and you can get a much smaller error bar of about 30 square degrees. That's still a lot, but it's not completely hopeless. So it turns out that that's the reason for more detectors. It's the localization on the sky. And now we've, by the time, this is a picture that was made within the last year. This is sort of a picture of all the black hole. This is the black hole mass going like that. And this is just a pretty picture of all the pairs we've seen. Everything where two black holes got together made a bigger one. And we've uh, the biggest one we've up here is almost at 160 so, solar masses. All of these, we don't know where they all come from. That's one of the nice and interesting puzzles that are coming out of this thing. Yes, they could come from collapsing stars, but they don't have to. They could come from collections of stars called um, globular clusters, where many, many stars live together. 10 to the 9 stars live in a small region. And you could have things dynamically make them. They could also come possibly from the initial universe. In other words, made somehow in the early universe before there were stars. That's an interesting idea. People have thought about that. Anyway, we don't know exactly where they come from. That's a big new puzzle that has happened. Now, the next source we saw was fascinating. This one we saw also in August of 2017. And you can see something already very different about it. Down here, since you're now a little familiar with these sonograms, you can see what this is. What happened here, and I'm trying to look at my watch, it didn't stop, okay. Uh, the, uh, it lasted a long time. Here, it's about, from here to there is about 10 seconds. Not, not fractions of seconds. And it built up nicely. And then eventually what happened is that these two things stopped. We, it's, it, it stopped outside of our range of frequencies. Oh, we're not sensitive enough. But I could play you this. I will do this anyway in the event that it works. But I'm not looking forward to it. I'll start this, but keep talking. This is a sound. If the sound works, it will give you a chirp. And you'll hear it as a chirp. Uh, now. I hope you heard that, but you may, may not have. So what the most important thing about this is that it was also seen by a ga gamma ray telescope in space. And just about that line right there, it was seen at both 10 to 50 keV and also between 50 to 300 keV of, of a gamma ray energy. And here is that burst. 
and it, it, seen it, and it was also seen by another satellite, and uh, that was not as uh, it didn't do it as well. I mean, these are very good sites. This one, well, you can see this not March. It's there, but it's marginal. Now, the important thing this does not only does it give confirmation, but it gives something else. It tells us two things. It tells us the gravitational wave got to us, let's say, at the moment of that bar right there. And we saw the gamma ray at about two seconds later. But this source was 160 million light years away from us. We can know that when we start solving for the masses. And for 160 million years, these two waves, the electromagnetic wave and the gravitational wave, were traveling parallel to each other. And they are only two seconds different. They may be zero seconds different because it may take two seconds for the explosion to build up in the at the star where the neutron these turn out to be two neutron stars as we'll see in a minute where it may take a while for them to make a display so gamma rays come so we learned immediately something which is what i told you in the beginning of the talk that einstein was right on the mark gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves travel at the same speed to a part in 10 to the 15. that's because it's so far away so anyway here's what came of that came of that here's the when you now look at the sky and you say, well, where did LIGO think it was? It's that banana and that banana. You add the, the uh, Virgo detector to it. It's in the here, that very small band. And uh, then here are the uncertainties of the, of, the, of, this, of, the, of the gamma ray telescopes. This is on Fermi. And that uncertainty of the uh, integral telescope is also on Fermi, but it's a different instrument, huge. So it turns out this sighting that we were able with the help of three detectors to tell where this is made it possible for astronomers to go look. And what they saw was this. They saw a galaxy. If you want the name it called a galaxy, it's up here. It's uh, just a galaxy far away, 140 million light years away. And here are stars that are in our own galaxy, these guys. They're in our own galaxy. And right there, there is something which wasn't there before. And in fact, they looked at that same place about 20 days before. The people look all the time. Here is that same galaxy. And here are those same stars. And here are that same place, and there's nothing there. Now, that was unbelievably scientifically productive. Because now optical telescopes, X-ray telescopes, gamma ray telescopes, uh, radio telescopes, everybody started training their telescope onto this, and they learned a tremendous amount of information. What they learned was indeed what I sort of blurted out, that this is two neutron stars, two stars that are the weight of the sun, but the size of, let's say, an average city. No, they're not very big for a star. And they're coming together. They're making an explosion, and we, they are going around each other. That's why they make gravitational waves. And they will form a black hole. And that was determined later by X-ray and gamma ray, X-ray and radio frequency measurements. And uh, they make a display that we, we later see as a jet that comes out just as the black hole forms. And what you see is a, what's called a kilonova. And a kilonova is after these two neutron stars have collided, all these neutrons, and, and there are protons in there too, but all neutrons, huge neutron density, they there's a cloud of neutrons that's highly, highly excited. And they make all sorts of things. One of the things they do is make the heavy elements. Here's the picture of what they do and something which people had guessed at, but they weren't sure of. Uh, they guessed at that the, this is a periodic table with a color coding. You've probably never seen one like this, but here's hydrogen and it's blue. And over here, over on the right is helium and that's blue. And what does blue mean? Well, it came from the initial explosion of the universe. And a little bit of the lightest other element, lithium, is made in the early universe as well. But most of the other stuff is made either in dying stars, exploding stars, uh, merging neutral, we'll get to that, that's where we're now, or exploding white dwarfs. So those are all these color codings. But nobody had quite figured out how you make the heaviest. All these very, very distant, like, for example, gold and platinum. People couldn't make gold and platinum in stars. It just didn't last long enough. It took cook nuclear nuclei that got that heavy by a process of collecting more and more neutrons onto a, a, 
a, bor a, a barium nucleus, for example. So we learned in this thing, which had been suspected, but not we were not absolutely sure. And now we know pretty well that all the heavy elements, especially these that people love, but also some they don't like, like plutonium and uranium, all of these things are made in the universe in collisions of neutron stars. That was a new piece of information. Another new piece of information that came out of that is really quite spectacular also. And it's a way to the future, looking into the future. This is a little more complicated, but those of you who know a little about cosmology probably get are quite aware of this. This is a probability curve. The probability gets better and better the higher you go. But here is a, the, the x-axis is an axis of the Hubble constant. What is that? We know the universe is expanding and the velocity of expansion as you look out gets larger and larger the further you look away from the Earth. And that took many, many, many years to get right. And this experiment did a beautiful job of doing it all internal to one experiment. And as you can do more and more of these, as we have more of them, we will get a very good number of this. And what, how does this work? It works by using the neutron star, which we you measured the mass of by looking at the gravitational wave uh, signal, how, at the frequencies of the gravitational wave signal, you get the masses. You get the distance uh, by looking at the amplitude of the gravitational wave that you measure at the Earth compared to the prediction that is made by the Einstein equation for how big is the gravitational wave strain at the source. So that we know that. We know we, if you measure carefully in our instrument how big is the signal, you get the distance. Now, you, get the, you don't get the redshift right away, which is the amount of shift of a spectral line, which is the, what was done by measuring the Hubble constant. You get the velocities by measuring the redshift. How much does a line shift toward the, toward, uh, let's say, a red line, sh I, I, I mean, a, a green line shift toward the red? That was a, that's the way you determine the velocity in ordinary astronomy. Here, you could do it if we knew exactly the conditions of, uh, of the of the of where that mass was we can't do that quite but we can do it in this case because we know what galaxy it was associated with and so we know the redshift that's associated with the velocity of that galaxy relative to us so we have all the information needed to make a prediction or number for the hubble constant which is that ratio of the velocity to the distance and uh, so here are the different measurements and there are two measurements that have been made recently. Uh, the one that's the classic measurement is the one in, in brown here. That, that, that's the way you measure supernova and measure their distance by looking how bright they are, and you measure their redshift with spectrometers. And that has slowly converged on a, was a, many, not within your lifetimes, it's changed by a factor of two. In my, certainly in my lifetime, it's changed by a factor of two. So it turns out that's again, the precision now is getting down to you know 10 percent or better. Here is another measurement that comes from using the early history of the universe as a way of deciding what must be the Hubble constant. You get that from cosmology and measuring the cosmic background radiation, and that gives you this band right here. And they don't agree, and people have made a big fuss about this. I don't know whether we should make a big fuss about that, but we, as life goes on, either this will get better and they will merge or they may not, and this gets better defined. Anyway, here's a third way to measure it. And here is the prediction you get from measuring using the LIGO detection. And it has the high probability, that's an accident, right between these two. That's, I'm sure, an accident. Look at the width of the uncertainty. Anyway, with many, many more neutron star binaries, which we will be seeing, uh, we will be able to get into that business as well with gravitational wave detection. Uh, the other thing that's in the future now we know we're not able to measure is something which is in the, and since this talk is a little about what's going to happen in the future as well, is when these two neutron stars get together and when they, especially as they get very close, they will do they will tear each other apart. In other words, before they collide, they one neutron star will pull with a gravitational the tidal force. The Newtonian tidal force, if you want to think of it that way, of one star on the other causes the nuclear material to become ellipsoidal. It stretches it, and it changes the frequency of the, of the, of, of the orbit, the orbital frequency. And what it does is this. It makes it go a little quick, more quickly. You can see that in this picture here. Uh, the tidal term has made it here. The, without the tidal term, 
the neutral this is this is the oscillation of the neutron star in that orbit around each other and but if you now include the uh stretching of the star it gets a little stiffer and that contributes to the torque and it makes it go so that the frequency of the orbit goes a little faster and that we tried to measure that but it is we can only get upper limits for it and has not yet limited what we call our ability to measure would be very good to do that because it will it will allow us to measure the what's called the equation of state of nuclear matter at ten at matter densities of ten to the well in, in a neutron star it'll be matter densities of ten to the fifteen. There's another thing that would be just as interesting or maybe even more interesting to people, and that's this: when after the two neutron stars have come together, that cloud of matter, the neutron matter, becomes a cloud of like a liquid. And that liquid has oscillation frequencies of its own, which will radiate gravitational waves. They radiate in the kilohertz department. And that there's some possible models. This, this was not observed. These are people who calculate what they might see as a function of the noise in the detector. And a and few of these oscillation frequencies sort of appear, show above what the A LIGO noise curve is. But this is at kilohertz. This down here is now kilohertz. Anyway, this is also in the future. So this. Uh, now, let me take you to uh, a feature of the field in terms of what we want to do in the future. And uh, this is uh, a picture which is a little arrogant. Uh, what you see here is uh, the, the, the same kind of noise versus frequency measurement predicted for the various detectors. The one that actually made the measurement and which we're talking about, all these measurements that you just talked about, is the one on the top here. It's the uh, advanced LIGO O2 curve. That's a real bunch of data, and that's the way it would It's not operating yet at design. At design, it'll be where this black curve is. So there's another factor of maybe one and a half, something like that, maybe two to go. And we already have planned and are building stuff to get to something called LIGO A+. plus. So this is probably the best we will do, at least at this present, the way our thinking goes, this green curve is the best we can probably do in the next four or five years in the facilities we have. But we don't want to stop there because we would love to do is to take this field, the field of gravitational wave astronomy, into cosmology. And there are people in the United States, there are also people in Europe, uh, in Europe, it's called, this project is called the Einstein Telescope. In the United States, it's called Cosmic Explorer. And these are now completely different detectors. In Europe, they're planning as the next detector to supplant the Virgo detector. They want to build a 10-kilometer triangle underground in Europe. And uh, they're busy trying to find sites for it and trying to figure out how much it might cost. In the United States, we're thinking that we could do almost as well as that, maybe a little better even, if we built a 40, four zero kilometer detector like LIGO on the surface. And we would want to build three of these around the world because we, we, we want to be able to identify where the sources are. And so here's a kind of thing that people, I'll show you what, this is a very pretty picture if you have the patience to look at it. What it is, is the radial distance here is the distance away from us. It's measured in units of the redshift, okay? So the edge of the universe is at, well, uh, somewhere in here. Uh, edge is very literal. It's not, there's, of course, there's no edge, but most of the universe's solid stuff is all over with by the time you get to there. And here is, let's look for black holes, for example. These white dots is the distribution of black holes as a function of distance away from us, okay? And you can see that, uh, here, the blue curve is the is is this one that, that the the LIGO we now have, and you can see that we don't see the things that are outside of us, but we do see the things that are inside here. So that's making up most of the black holes we're seeing. And then if you get to let's say LIGO A plus, you'll be right in the middle of the distribution of all the black holes. So we should be getting black holes at a rate of a few per hour. And if you then build Cosmic Explorer, or and then make improvements on it. These are these red and these purple lines. You're going to see the entire distribution of black holes in the universe. And you will also find out, for example, maybe if those black holes are primordial. 
because then this doesn't look that way anymore. And here is the same situation for the neutron stars. These are curves only for things we already know. I mean, the curve gets much more exciting when you plot things you don't know because you can put them anywhere. But uh, the, uh, so here is the same story. Uh, we are seeing maybe one or two a year of, um, of these neutron star binaries right now. And if you want to do that Hubble measurement, yeah, here you still won't do very well with advanced, with the uh, advanced LIGO A plus. That's, whoops. Uh, this, this curve right there. But if you build the Cosmic Explorer, you're right in the middle of the, the neutron star distribution. Okay, and if you build, and that's why we want to build CE2 eventually, and you want to get even outside of, you want to get every neutron star binary. Look, this is just a way of showing what the power is of this. This gets you into cosmology, which is an absolutely fascinating area because gravitational waves are expected of all different kinds from the universe. So, at any rate, here's my last slide. And this gives you, I want to give you a quick overview of what's going on everywhere at all different frequency scales, all different time scales. And I have to be fast because I'm a little over already. Well, no, I, I have another three minutes. And so this is a, a picture where here's frequency down below, starting with 10 kilohertz and once per age of universe over here. You can see it up in the time scales from a thousandth of a second to a tenth of a second, and here, age of the universe. And now here are the different projects. We've talked a lot about LIGO, so I won't say much more about that. What's immediately going on already in Europe and in the United States at one time was an American project, which the Americans gave to the Germans effectively by saying they don't have the money to build it. And uh, so this is a satellite measurement based on having three detectors in a triangle and then in an orbit that is in an equilateral triangle around the same position of the, from the sun as the Earth, and it goes around once a year around the sun. And a very clever orbit, if you incline this triangle to the orbit, uh, this will need very little station, station keeping. You won't have to put much rocketry on any of these things to keep that orbit and that triangle in existence. And this thing has a lovely future. It'll look at black holes, and massive black holes, like the ones in our own galaxy when they eat something. And they're all over the galaxy. So they're going to be guaranteed to see enormous black holes and little black holes falling into big holes. And that'll be a marvelous way to test general relativity. Uh, and then uh, we'll also look at all many white dwarf binaries in our own galaxy. And that may be a worry because it might be so noisy from those that people worry about it. I'm not worried about it. There'll always be enough information to separate the big black holes from the white dwarf binaries. Anyway, these are all gravitational wave signals. Here's an experiment that's going on right now, and that is to use pulsar timing in our own galaxy as a way of measuring gravitational waves that are coming through our galaxy. And the idea is that as a gravitational wave comes through our galaxy and you look at a very distant pulsar and look at it, the frequency of its pulsations, as the gravitational wave goes by, the frequency of the pulsations will change a little. And that will happen at different, in different, uh, with, uh, as a function of our position in the, as a function of our position in the galaxy, relative to all the different pulsars. You want to look at many, many pulsars, and they have about 40 to 50 pulsars distributed all over the galaxy that they want to look at, and they will look for at a pattern that the gravitational wave makes, namely that, let's say, all the pulsars that are in the north and south will go a little faster. And all the pulsars in the east and west, they'll go a little slower. I mean, I, I'm just making that up. There will be a pattern that looks quadrupolar. And they now have done already a lot of looking. They are, at this moment, analyzing signals that they think might have come from gigantic black holes colliding to each other. That's one of the things that 10 to the 12, 10 to the 11 solar mass black holes in the early parts of the universe. Uh, but the trouble of that experiment it takes years, four or five years, to develop enough statistics so that you can make a new measurement. Here's the thing that's going on right now also, and that's a very exciting experiment that made a, a claim for a detection but was wrong, and I don't blame them for it, but they're doing it right now. And these people are using the cosmic background radiation, which is the microwave background. It's electromagnetic cosmic background that we have detected, the three degrees background. and they are looking to see if that three degree background has, ha, it has polarization. In other words, every electromagnetic wave has, is polarized. But you can do something if there are primordial 
gravitational waves generated by inflation, which is a new idea and wild idea, in fact. But in inflation, uh, if Starobinsky in, in Russia is right, there you expect quantum fluctuations really quantum fluctuations in the universe, when the universe was very, very tiny, that they would cause gravitational waves to be generated by the fluctuations of the density in, that are due to the quantum mechanics of the universe. And those gravitational waves now cause patterns in the polarization. And that's what, those, that's what you see in this picture, patterns in the polarization. They're called B modes in the polarization of the light that is emitted by the uh, plasma that's very, very much later than the, when the gravitational waves were generated. So the history here is gravitational waves get generated at time t equals zero almost. And we're looking at the plasma 300,000 years after that. And that has density fluctuations in it induced by the gravitational waves, which cause the polarization to change and make a pattern in the polarization. And that experiment was done from high altitude and for example, there's a very important experiment in the Atacama Desert uh, that's now going on in the South Pole, um, uh, which will hope to show this, these B modes. That's an exciting experiment. And if that fails or it succeeds, it doesn't matter. There are P ideas for how to do a direct measurement of the gravitation waves from that primordial period. Unfortunately, it's not going to be done by any of these experiments on the right. It's going to take a new apparatus you stick in space. What it'll be, it'll be a combination of the, uh, the LISA experiment, which is a, uh, the satellite experiment, with the techniques that have been developed on the ground. And that's so complicated that people don't think about it for another 50 years. Anyway, thank you very much. So uh, we thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the excellent talk. And for that, I'll ask everybody in this moment to turn on their microphones for a huge round of applause <laughs> in acknowledgement. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, so we I have should, some questions. Should I get out of this? Uh, mode so you can we can so we can see each other or what it's what, what, up to what you professor maybe you you will use your slides i mean to answer some of the questions but i leave it completely up to you so uh, but before we we go move to the questions let me give you uh, uh, an overview of the audience of more than 150 people that have been attending to this uh, uh, lecture of yours so uh the these people come from from uh, all around Brazil, from all the five different regions in Brazil, north, northeast, center, west, uh, southeast and south. States like, obviously, Pará, where I'm speaking from, Amazonas, uh, Pernambuco, Rio Grande do Norte, Paraíba, Goiás, Mato Grosso do Sul, Rio de Janeiro, São Paulo, Minas Gerais, Santa Catarina, Rio Grande do Sul. So, obviously, we have undergraduate and graduate students postdocs, teachers, and professors of our graduate program, like Angela Cautal, Caio Macedo, Danilo Alves, Jorge Cassias, Manuel Leutério. We have also people from other areas, not only from physics, but uh, related areas like geophysics. We have here Cis Professor Cicero Regis. We have people from the countryside of Pará State. That's a very big state, right, from cities uh, uh, near and far, like Capitão Poço, Castanhal, Salinópolis. We have uh, uh, teachers and professors from universities and institutes from all around Brazil. I, I uh, excuse uh, for taking this time, but I've just mentioned some of them. Uh, Alvaro Nogueira, Berita Coyle, Cecília Quirente, Ciclâmbio Barreto, Daniel Vanzela, Edson Moreira, Horácio Dottorio, A Vaga, Elias Shapiro, João Braga, Maurício Calvão, uh, Maurício Coutinho, Múcio Continentino, Nelson Studa, Odilo Aguiar, Raíssa Mendes, Rose Santos, Sati Skuma Vieira, Tobias Frederico, Valdir Bezerra, so this is a, 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 a very representative audience from us Brazilians that know more or less each other. So all, as I said, different regions of Brazil, but not only from Brazil, we have in the audience people from Argentina, like uh, uh, Mariano Dominguez. Uh, we have people attending from Denmark, like Rafael Santos. We have people from Italy, like Alexander Kamenchik. We have Aloxenia from India, 
we have Carlos Fajardo from Mexico. So, as I said, I mean, people from not only all around Brazil, but also from different continents, right, uh, attending to this talk. So let's move to the questions then. Uh, the first question that I have here comes from Elia Shapiro from the uh, University of Juiz de Fora uh, in Minas Gerais. Shapiro, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it for you? So no, maybe you better read it. Okay, so I'll read it. Uh, so uh, Elia asks, what is the amplitude of the oscillation of the atoms in the detector uh, due to the gravitational wave. Okay, let's not monkey with it. Uh, yes, the atoms are, if you think of, of the atoms moving classically, okay, in, the surf, in a solid, they're moving much larger amplitudes than we're measuring, okay? But so how can you get away with that? In other words, uh, why aren't we disturbed completely by the noise of the surface of the mirror? That's the question that was being asked of me. And that's a good question. The reason we aren't is because there's so many atoms and they average to a much smaller amplitude over the size of the beam. The laser beam is about uh, 12 centimeters in diameter by the time it hits the surface. And so you average over the mo uh, motion of something like 10 to the uh, 20, 24 atom motion, 10 to 23 atoms all moving more than the so it's the square root of that number in the end that square root of that number is still smaller than what we're measuring okay so that's a good question but it's you have to think of it yes you couldn't do it with a single atom you need that large collection of atoms that make up the mirror okay and, so and, thank and, you that's a good question i've not i've not been asked that question before <laughs> Okay, so uh, thank you, Ilya, for your question. Thank you, uh, Professor Weiss, for your answer. So let's move to the next question. This com comes from Satish Kuma, uh, VH from Rio de Janeiro. Satish, do you want to make the question yourself or do you want me to read it? Thank you, Luis. Um, I did, um, hello, Dr. Weiss. Um, is, is it even physically possible to build a Weber bar with sensitivity equal to LIGO? Is it even possible? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what the people who were working on in Brazil were hoping. Um, I'll tell you why. It, 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 I, I'm very, it's not that it can't be done, but it's no longer that interesting to do. I'll tell you, the Weber bar itself had a strain sensitivity at best of about 10 to the minus 15, 1, 5. But that was the, and we have to measure a strain of 10 to the minus 21. So the, there's a factor of a million there. Now, the people who made the spherical bar could do better than Weber by because they cooled it, it was bigger, and they had better sensors. But they were struggling to get to 10 to minus 21. Okay. And the other problem is, and this is the reason why I don't think it's, I don't mean to dump on them, but I'm saying that if you have something which has the bandwidth of LIGO, in other words, LIGO has a bandwidth that's probably what, seven, eight kilohertz, if it's no, and, and or when we make it bigger, it'll be less bandwidth. But we'll have a bandwidth where you, you don't you don't have to look only around a line, a single line, a resonant line in a solid. And that was the other big problem that Weber had. He could his bars were sensitive at 1.6 kilo, kilohertz, and they were you, they were looked for they looked for pulses which at that frequency. Now, it's true, the Fourier components of a pulse will show up at 1.6 kilohertz, but you lose so much of the pulse energy by only looking at 1.6 kilohertz. And that's the reason he was in trouble. And the bar, that's where the spherical bar people have a similar problem. So if I was going to put a big investment in Brazil or anywhere in, 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 in I know there's ideas in, to put in the Southern hemisphere, and especially in South America, the people who I know are thinking about building a detector, I would recommend they build an interferometer because of the bandwidth, okay? So I gave you a multiple answer to that, but, uh, but don't, I, don't think it's I don't think it's worth doing it, uh, making a spherical. And the people who are doing it now, I think have come to that realization. Thank you. One, one, one quick question. I heard you are writing a book. Maybe you should plug in. Oh, <laughs> we're not, I'm not just writing, but a lot of us are writing the history of LIGO. We're trying to do that. You know, it's Kip and Barry, 
the two guys you mentioned. But on top of that, some of our very best younger younger people are, are helping with us, and they're all they're the five authors of that book. And it's at, not yet in any state to be read by anybody. We're still not sure how we want to do it, but we are writing furiously. But I don't know if we ever get it together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Satish, for your questions. Thank you, Professor Weiss, for your answer. So uh, the next question come from, comes from uh, Elder Lima. Elder is a high school teacher in Sao Paulo, and uh, I'll translate it for you. So uh, when, when the gravitational waves passes by uh, a beam of light, uh, a laser light, right, uh, which are the, the modifications or the influence of the gravitational waves yeah. in the properties of light, right? I mean, if you could make a that's kind a of... Very good, that's a very good question. And I'll tell you that this is one of these problems with general relativity, which you know better than I do, okay? Uh, but the thing is, let me tell you, there are two ways to interpret what we are measuring. You can't use both of them simultaneously. You can't use them both simultaneously. You have to go one way or the other, when I, what I'm about to tell you. But you can't do both, okay? One way to think about it is that the gravitational wave actually exerts forces on those mirrors. And that's the way Weber thought about it. And if you're a specialist in general relativity, what you're doing is you're using the Ricci tensor as a, as a force. It's a differential force as a, gra as a gradient force. That's one way to think about it. It's nothing wrong with that. On the other hand, I don't like forces. I happen to think that forces, I think that Einstein got rid of them, and why should we reinvent them? And, um, and so the other way to think about it is quite subtle, but I, it's aesthetically more interesting to me. And that is that there is actually an interaction between the gravitational wave and the electromagnetic wave. And this is a thing a theorist could do. Um, you can say, take the theory of Maxwell's equations and apply them to a gravitational wave in general relativity. And you will find out something very interesting. It does actually do something to the gravitational wave. It puts side bands. In other words, let's say you have a very pure frequency, gravita uh, pure frequency light wave. And now it comes into a region where there is a gravitational wave. What you get, the, the light, interact, the, gra the gravitational wave interacts with the light to cause little tiny, very tiny amplitude sidebands to the main light wave, which are at a frequency that are omega of the gravitational wave, the frequency of the gravitational wave different than the initial LIGO and the initial laser was. So you have the following thing, after the gravitational wave has started interacting with the laser light, you have a, the laser light, which is at frequency omega zero, and then you have another wave at omega zero plus omega gravitational wave, and another wave at omega minus omega, like omega zero minus omega gravitational wave. And I would love to see if we could ever show that, okay? It's another way of expressing the same, but then there are now forces. You got rid of the forces. If you apply both methods, then you get either nothing or double the effect, okay? So be careful, okay? Okay, so thank you, uh, uh, Elder, for your question, Professor Weiss, for your answer. So the next question comes from Yuri Falcão. He did not write uh, 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 what he is doing now, but I mean, he, I know he's, he's now attending from the northeast of Brazil, his city in Pernambuco. And he, he, uh, he wrote in Portuguese, I'll try to translate it. So uh, his question is about the, the collision of two black holes, just about the moment the two black holes get together, so uh, uh, there you, you illustrated with uh, 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 some, some graphs and some plots. And maybe if you could say something about this moment where the collision happens uh, uh, or the fusion happens, uh, uh, I think he will be happy. Well, I wish I could. <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> I, I don't think there is right now, the person who might be able to answer that more intelligently than I is Kip, Kip Thorne, okay? On the other hand, what I do know is the following. It's a very different kind of collision than happens with anything else because there is no tidal term. In other words, the, this is pure energy that gets collected into a black hole. 
And what happens is that it, if you take, let's start with the new two neutron stars. When they collide, they, they stretch each other and eventually they tear each other apart. Nothing like that happens with the black hole. There's no way to tear a black hole apart. So what happens is that, that there, first, there's no tidal term at all. So they, even though they're made out of pure energy, they don't stretch. None of, none of those formulae that are used in generating the waveform for a black hole pair as they get closer and closer, is there a term in there for the stretching of the, of the black hole that isn't there? It doesn't happen. So that's a very, very important thing. So there's no forgiveness in the black hole. It stays the black hole. Now, what happens is once the black holes collide, and it's very shortly, at the, almost the instant just before they collide, something interesting happens in the space around them. And that was discovered a long time ago by a lot of people who started doing perturbation theory in gravity. They found out that when you have two black holes collide, the metric, that's the space around them, around the two black holes, begins to oscillate like it has its own normal modes. The space itself oscillates, not just the black holes, the space around them. And so you have, in fact, a whole set of normal modes, like a bell. They're not very good bells. They have, they're very strongly damped by the gravitational waves, but they have definite frequencies and definite uh, uh, storage times. And we are now looking for those, by the way, and we, I think we have begun to see them in the data analysis. So there are two things that are happening on. The black holes are making a signal which is unforgiving, but the space around them is singing along with them. And that is making the whole collision a little more interesting. Uh, what ha is happening is that, it, that the space is oscillating itself and has all these different frequency modes. And they contribute to that waveform that, that you saw. And th that's the reason at high frequencies where, and, and at, at the, when the collision is almost over, uh, and, it's, and it's very hard because the noise is so large there, we will do better and better on measuring that as we get more and more black holes. But that's the best I can tell you. There's more going on than just the black holes. The space itself is oscillating. Thank you for the answer, Professor. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Yuri, for the question. Uh, thank you, Professor Weiss, for the very nice answer, I should say. Mauricio yeah. Calvão from uh, University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, do you want to make the question yourself, uh, Mauricio? Yeah, thank you, Crispino. You're welcome. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank again the very pedagogical lecturer, Professor Weiss. And I would like to make, if possible, several questions, but then I will make uh, just one, which is related to what you might say about uh, the technique for detection of the specific polarization of the gravitational waves, and particularly taking okay. into account that alternative theories of gravity induce not only the plus and cross usual polarizations of GR, but also such kind of polarization as the breeding modes and other other yeah, kinds of polarization. It. So what, what mm -hmm. could you tell about uh, the specific observational experimental techniques for polarization uh, detection hey, of gravitation? That's, that's a very good question because I left all of that out. You didn't hear me talk about it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, in fact, the, let me say that just so that everybody realizes, the question really has to do with something which is important that will affect ultimately how you use the gravitational waves to determine what is going on at the source. In other words, if you want to look in detail at the waveforms, which we are trying to do, and from them determine what is actually the dynamics going on at the source, we have to be able to separate the polarizations. And the way you do that, let me tell you, LIGO had to make a decision. And uh, you, you can a, fault us for that decision if you want. We made the decision because we weren't sure if we were ever going to detect anything, that we made the two detectors, the one in Louisiana and the one in Pacific Northwest, be arranged in such a way that they can only measure the same polarization. Now, we did that very, very deliberately. They oriented so that they only measure the same polarization. And uh, the reason was that way we would be 
highest probability of being able to get coincidence measurements, which was to us very important. And we, we said that, yes, later on, if there are more detectors, we will then be able to get the polarization. And that's what's going on right now. In other words, we were not able to get polarization information from LIGO alone, but we are able to get some polarization information from Virgo and LIGO together because Virgo did not build itself to be uh, sensitive to only the same polarization as, we, as, as LIGO is. And that's the way you will get it. If you have detectors that are in different places on the Earth, you will get position information. Now, if you also have them not being oriented in the same way, all of them, so that they're all sensitive to the same polarization, you will get two pieces of information. You will get both the polarization and the position. And that's another argument for having multiple detectors. Mm -hmm. So right now, we're not efficient at getting the polarization. And the question you raise about whether other theories of gravity are, 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 can yet be ruled out, I can only tell you one thing. I think there are enough of those theories that say that the, pro the velocity of gravitational waves should not be the velocity of light, that you could throw them out. I think you can, with, say, with sure, real assurance, throw them away. Uh, I don't think we can throw out anything that satisfies all the other tests of general relativity and has predicts a different polarization than the Einstein polarizations. So we're not, we, have, we cannot make a statement about that yet. Okay. But uh, sorry, you would say we already have the technology oh, yeah. to measure polarization with... Yeah, but that's the same technology. It's just a matter of or orienting the detector. Okay. So... So the planes of the arms are essentially parallel, perhaps. That's right. And the way you, the way you do that is you take, take the, the, the L's, project them to the center of the Earth, okay, and see how much they lie on top of each other. And what, if you get some of those, you would like to have them be at 45 degrees to each other, okay? okay. That's the other polarization. And that's easy to get. Virgo is about 30 degrees to, uh, to LIGO, okay? So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Mauricio, for your question. Thank you, Professor Weiss, for your answer. So uh, we have uh, more questions here. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll join two of them together so you can decide uh, how you answer. So one is a second question from the, the, the high school teacher, Elder Silva. Uh, he is asking if uh, LIGO works ininterruptedly, I mean, uh, all the time or stops for the first run, second run, third run, obviously. Yeah. I mean, yeah, well, uh, that's... And the, uh, the second okay. question, maybe you can give a joint answer, uh, comes from Elismar Los from uh, Santa Catarina, a, a city in the south of Brazil. And uh, he says, is there a way to figure out the distance to an object using gravitational waves emission? He's a student on a graduate program. Oh, yeah, no, we, need, we desperately need to figure out the distance. But we had to measure to, to be, let me start by, we measure the distance now to the object by looking at the amplitude of the wave as we measure it. And then once we have the masses, once we, have, we know the masses from the frequencies, okay? And once we know that, we know what to put into the Einstein equation for the solution. We solve the Einstein equations by numerically and get the amplitude of the strain at the source or some other distance. Then you look at what's predicted for the amplitude that should be, and we measure it. And that, gives you the distance right away because the amplitude of the strain goes down as one over the distance from the source, okay? No, without that, we couldn't do the cosmology, okay? So we measure the distance by using theory and the measurement of the amplitude of the strain we measure. And a lot of argument goes into how well can we measure that amplitude? Well, we're now able to sort of measure that to probably five to 10%, okay? We have an error of five to 10%, depending on how strong the source is. Now, the other part of the question is actually a very important one too, operationally. We, if we want to keep improving, and we do that, that's what we do every time we stop running. We have come up with a way to make the detector more sensitive or have a more, broader bandwidth. And then a decision is made. It's not an easy decision to stop running and, and make the improvement and then go back to running again. If we can't do that, then the thing would get, actually, we would never make any improvements in the system. And that's another reason for having multiple detectors. So for example, it would be quite a pity if LIGO, if both LIGO detectors were dead 
at the moment when a supernova went off in our own galaxy. Now, that would be a major opportunity missed. So you, and if, if LIGO is the only one that has a sensitivity to do that. So that's another argument for having multiple detectors and all equally sensitive. So uh, thank you, uh, Elio and uh, Elder and uh, uh, Elisma for your questions, Professor Weiss for your answer. The next question comes from Ciclânio Barreto from Rio Grande do Norte in the, north, in the northeast of Brazil. Ciclânio, do you want to make the question yourself? Or do you want me to read it? So you can do it. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. It's in the chat. So a general question: uh, We have seen an ex spectacular expansion of as astronomy when it stopped being made exclusively in the visible light band and used other bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. The contempor contemporary view of the universe is only possible until now due to this boom, he says. Uh, how can uh, the impact of astronomy made with uh, gravitational waves be compared with this historical impact of astronomy uh, when using wider bands of the electromagnetic spectrum? Okay. Well, yeah, that, that's a basic question and one of the most important ones when you try to get more funding for this field, okay? And it's, I think it has a charming answer. I really, I think you'll like the answer. Uh, the... It's been, as you say, very important to be able to look with radio all the way up to X-ray or even gamma ray. And we learn all the different possible things from that. And with gravitational waves, they even have a, they have a, and neutrinos and particle physics, we have something called multi-messenger astronomy. And that has paid off dramatically in this neutron star detection, for example. But let me say what is the real advantage. I think the gravitational one, and it's not because I worked on it, has something which is different than all the others. And that is that the gravitational waves, they have a penalty for this. They're very hard to detect. As you know, it took 50 years to get instruments that would detect them. But once you have those instruments, you get a nice advantage out of that because the gravitational waves don't interact with anything. They, in fact, interact less than anything in the, that has ever been thought of. Neutrinos interact dramatically with matter if you compare them to gravitational waves. In fact, you can take a gravitational wave if it's generated, let's say, at, uh, at, 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 the, at a Hubble distance to the left, and you want to go to a Hubble distance at the right, that wave will not have been touched. It'll be identical in, it'll be weaker but there will be no scattering. Nothing has been done to that wave to change it, except it getting weaker because it's spreading out. And there, this is something that is absolutely unique to gravitational waves. And for example, one of the things that is so important with that, and you can ask, why does that happen? Why is gravitational waves so penetrating? It's the most penetrating radiation in, in all of nature. It's because when you, th let me say why that is so that you understand it. It, it, when you take light, light is able to induce in the atoms and the, the matter that's in the way, is able to introduce dipoles and quadrupoles in the matter, and they will re-radiate the, the wave, and they will disturb the way the wave gets propagated, and that's called the index refraction. And so you will get all sorts of effects that change the initial wave. That same process will happen with gravitational waves. Gravitational waves will cause stretching of space and matter that will then recreate further new gravitational waves. But when you put the numbers in, you have to say it's a thing that has to do with the numbers. You, the, first of all, the gravitational wave is so hard to generate to begin with, and then you make it doubly hard exponentially, you will just not have any scattered light, a scattered gravitational wave generated by the matter in between. And that's even true if you have a, 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 an enormous density of black holes. It's just not possible. So it turns out that if you want to look inside of a supernova, for example, you want to look at really what's going on inside what's happening, the dynamics in a supernova, you're not going to do that with electromagnetic radiation. It gets disturbed. You won't see it. But the gravitational waves will tell you exactly what's going on with the bulk of the matter that's going on and how it moves inside the supernova. The same thing is true if you want to look at the beginning of the universe. It'll go through all of that, all of the universe, all this 
you know, all that hot universe, everything that goes on up to the moment of the inflation going backwards, you can, can in principle, if you can make a sense, a sense enough detector, sensitive enough detector, you can go back and see what inflation looked like. And nothing will have disturbed it. And that's, I think, gravitational waves' big advantage. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Siklami, for a question. And thank you very much, uh, Professor Weiss, for your answer. Next question comes also from Satish. Satish, do you want to make it quickly? You may skip my question, please, because of the time. Thank you. Okay, so if we have time, we can back, come back to that again. So uh, another question comes from Mikhail Miravet. I don't know where he's speaking from. Mikhail, do you want to make the question yourself? Do you want me to read it? Well, I mean, it was an, a specific question about the graph. Uh, so he asks uh, if uh, uh, where it would be possible to locate the gravitational waves from the core collapse supernova in the graph you were showing uh, uh, by the end of your talk. So maybe I'll just skip that one too, unless he, he wants to, to speak. Uh, uh, then we have a question from Luis Longo. Uh, Luis, do you want to make the question yourself? Although, I mean, uh, Professor Weiss touched upon it a bit. It was the oh. bicep uh, experiment. Uh, oh, okay. Luis, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll read it. So what is Hello. the current state of the bicep experiment after the wrong uh, claim uh, uh, that uh, you mentioned? Mm -hmm. And and do they have a, a time estimate for getting a correct result? Well, no, I think that's an important experiment. <clears throat> and it's important whether they find something or not. The bicep, it's, it's now being done by many more people than bicep. I mean, there are groups in two, th three groups in the United States, coupled with the European and South American groups too. Turns out the three major groups are, one of them is using primarily the Atacama Desert site. That's the Simon Observatory. That's a huge group, a collection of people. Uh, the South Pole experiment is still going on. There's a Chinese experiment in the Himal Himalayas that has um, several Asian contributors to it. I don't know them all. But and the important thing is that they what they've done different <clears throat> than the bicep is they're not just looking at one wavelength. The, see, the mistake that bicep made was to look only at one wavelength, one uh, electromagnetic wavelength. And that makes you very, very vulnerable to being fooled by synchrotron emission, which falls at the same frequency, and also by dust emission which falls at the same frequency. So if you want to protect yourself against that, you have to have more channels, more frequency channels, so you can look at the synchrotron radiation at lower frequencies than your main, your main interrogation frequency, and at the dust at higher frequencies. And uh, that was the mistake they made. And uh, in fact, I think there's some people in the group who I think are vulnerable to having known that and trying to publish anyway. I'm not happy with that. But they did a beautiful experiment otherwise. And now they are doing it with multiple, multiple wavelengths, and so are the people in the Atacama Desert. And, and uh, I expect that uh, those of you who are know, know about this, a, a number that is used by the people who are doing those experiments is their ability to measure a ratio of a tensor polarization that's done due to gravitational waves to a scalar one, which is just done because of the heat temperature differences in the, in, the, in the cosmic background. And it turns out that ratio uh, in the initial bicep experiment was about 0.1. In other words, they thought they had seen a contribution from the tensor part, which is the part that's from gravitational waves, uh, already by that ratio being 0.1. Since then, people have gotten down to about, well, uh, well, I don't know exactly. Nobody's really published a lot about that. But their, their, their next experiment, when it's published this year, I expect, will be at about 0.01, factor of 10 better. This is now 10 years later almost. And that's because there have been many advances in those, in those experiments. And they have the capability, they believe, to take that experiment another factor of 10 better to 0.001. And that, they claim, is another 10 years after this this next announcement. And if they see nothing at that level, then that would be interesting. And look, I don't, I don't care what they do. I just hope they get the experiment 
done so all of us can sort of relish what might come of it. The numbers that can be done by LIGO-like experiment in space are comparable to the 0 0.001, or maybe even a little better than that. Uh, on the other hand, the big problem will be the same problem in the gravitational wave business as it is in the uh, in, in, the, in the millimeter wave business, electromagnetic millimeter wave business, there will be a background from all the gravitational wave sources, and that you have to subtract, and that's going to maybe be very difficult. So, you know, it may never get there, but I think it's so important to measure that, that you should try every technique that you can think of. It's one of, it's, I think it's the most important experiment you can do with gravitational waves. Okay, so... Thank you, Longo, for your question. Thank you, Professor Reiner, for, for your answer. So uh, uh, the nec next question comes from uh, also from Pernambuco, uh, Professor Mauricio Coutinho. Do you want to make the question your yourself? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you for this beautiful seminar. And I'd like to make a, a very general question. Uh, it's connected. Uh, could you comment on the uncertainty principle and the gravitation theory? I, uh, I'll say that again. Go back. On whose principle? Uh, yeah. The uncertainty principle, principle which... and gravitation theory. Yeah. What, what principle? Uncertainty, uncertainty principle. principle. The uncertainty ah, principle. Ah, the uncertainty principle. Okay. Uh, and I, 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 my motivation is a paper by Ronald Adler and co works. In, 90, in 2001, and Ronald Adler was a faculty member in our department at Recife back many years ago. And there are certain people can uh, lead to limitations of and the size of black holes and so on. Well, I don't know much about the limitation of, and I really don't, it's not even, that I can answer you in a sensible way about what might be the quantum limits in a gravitational theory. That I can't answer because I don't know if there's a good quantum theory of gravity. But I can tell you this, that we are spending a lot of time dealing with the quantum theory of the way we make the detection. And is that what the man wrote about? Is that he wrote about the detection? Or did he write about the, uh, the, the quantum problems that are associated with quantum theory itself. So that, that's much harder than what I can answer. But I can answer the question of the ability of the measurement. And you, we are already at the quantum limit right now in the measurements we're making of the position and momentum of those mirrors. In other words, we now see that, in fact, it's we're, I haven't mentioned this because of the, it wasn't necessary, but we are now using techniques in the recent measurements of the gravitational waves using the interferometers, where we are using the quantum, the quantum tailoring of the light to make it so that we do something called squeezing the state. And let me explain to you what that is. That's in the measurement. That's not about gravity. It has nothing to do with gravity, but it has to do with how you make the measurement. And the fact is we are limited now by the wave function of the thing we're looking at, the wave function of that 40 kilogram mass. We are at that point where that has behaved quantum mechanically. You have to worry about it. So there's an interesting thing that you can do. Uh, and that's called, you can, and I, the paper I would refer you to is written by Carlton Caves, C-A-V-E-S. And those papers, just under Caves, you will see how this works. You can do a measurement at one frequency of, of, of one frequency of motion, where you are sensitive only to the phase noise of the light, and not the amplitude noise in the light. The two non-computing variables in with light are the phase of the light and the amplitude of the light. Those are like the momentum and the position. Okay. So you'll see there's an uncertainty relationship of how well you can measure the phase and how well you can measure the amplitude. You can't do infinitely well with both of them, okay? So it turns out that, and that shows up in the measurement of the motion of the mass. It shows up that we, and you can see this from the Heisenberg microscope. If you start sending photons 
at a mass, it'll cause the mass to wiggle. That's how you, know, you get the uncertainty relationship when you teach it in an ordinary quantum course. You know, the fact that you made the measurement with a high intensity light or high, to make the wavelength small, you had to use high energy photons. These kicked the mass. So you can't simultaneously measure the position of the mass and the momentum of the mass simultaneously. That's a famous conundrum in quantum theory. The same thing happens with big masses. And when you talk about trying to make a precision measurement, you screw up by putting momentum into the big mass by doing it. But you can avoid that. And you can avoid that by doing two things, tailoring the light so that it only has phase noise in it at one frequency and only amplitude noise at another frequency. And those two things, the amplitude noise doesn't matter at all when you look at high frequencies. And the, the phase noise matters dramatically at high frequencies. On the other hand, at low frequencies where you push the mass around, it responds to these low frequencies. You can make it so that the phase noise is all there is and the amplitude noise has been reduced. So you can play a game to beat the uncertainty relationship. You don't completely beat it over all frequencies, but you can make it very special so that high frequencies, you have only phase noise, and at low frequencies, you only have amplitude noise. And the way you do that is by making paired photon states, it's photon states that are correlated. And those are called squeezed states, OK? And that's a beautiful thing. We're doing that right now already and have already improved the sensitivity of the detectors by about a factor of one and a half to two because we've paired photons. And the, you don't do that at the input. Of, you don't do it where the laser is. The laser noise drops out. You do that at the other port of the interferometer where the quantum fluctuations come in. The quantum, and that's what Carlton Kays will show you. The quantum fluctuations come into the interferometer at where the detector is. That's where they come in. And those fluctuations, you can, you can make them smaller by finding if a quantum fluctuation, you effectively induce a second photon to be generated. And to do two things, you let the quantum fluctuation come in, you have a nonlinear medium. In that nonlinear medium, you generate an amplified version of the quantum fluctuation and another photon. Those two photons, you can now pair them in such a way that they only have phase modulation sidebands or only amplitude modulation sidebands. And that's the trick. And that's the best I can tell you. But that doesn't apply to qu the quantum theory as it applies to gravity. That I can't tell you much about. Thank you. <clears throat> Look, okay. I got I to gotta stop. Please. And another, another one or two, because I, I got I to do some other stuff. <laughs> okay. Well, it's up to you. You decide. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. let let us let us leave a final final question, and then we. we finish As you wish. Okay. So uh, uh, Jose Ademir uh, from University of São Paulo, do you want to make the question, uh, Ademir? Yes, Crispin. Thank you. <laughs> thank You're you welcome. for the opportunity, <laughs> and uh, thank you also to, to Professor Weiss by the great the great seminar my question uh, is related with the uh, back reaction or if you prefer with the radiation reaction radiation reaction in the electromagnetic case is a very well studied subject but perhaps we may have problems here in, in, in with gravitational waves uh, because if we, we use your numbers, uh, a non-negligible uh, mass, in this case for extreme events like black holes, is transformed in radiation, right? Well, let me, I, I got up to the last sentence, ask the last part of your question again, just the very last sentence. Yes, yes. I, 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 a part, a non-negligible part of the mass for extreme events like black holes is transformed in radiation. Is that, that's the part I want to, it's the back More radiation the, reaction, the radiation reaction. Yeah, yes. Okay. And then, uh, 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 and this, this creates several problems because uh, uh, my first question related with that, uh, I would like to know 
if uh, if the experiment if the the program if the 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 treatment uh, has this as an input for the system yeah okay uh, I... the, the second point is that uh, uh, the observations until now may give us some idea of the property of the property of the space-time itself, because we have vibrations in the space-time. I would like to know if this, if if the space-time may absorb part of these waves, and we have intervening matter between the sources and the interferometer. And the, this may also absorb part of the of the waves. And mm -hmm. I would like to know mm -hmm. if if this kind of noise uh, are taken into account. Okay, so I, I, I can I answer you. Let me answer your question. Two of them. Uh, first of all, I let me start with the second question first. Okay, and then I'll answer the first one. Okay. Right now, and and I I I do not believe that there is any interaction of any consequence between the gravitational wave as it travels through matter in the universe and us. In other words, the scattering, call it the radiation reaction if you want, by the intervening matter between us and the source is of no consequence. It's there. I'm not disagreeing that there is acceleration of the matter between us and the source, and that there is a small amount of re-radiation by that, but it's a detail you have to work yourself. You will see that the amount of re-radiation is absolutely negligible compared to the wave. That's the problem. It's not that there isn't there. It's a re you have to sit down and do a detailed calculation of that. It's not hard to do that. Here's the way you do that. Calculate the H value in a wave, okay, the strain. Apply that to two clouds of dust or anything you want between us and the source. Then recalculate the radiation by that dust due to the acceleration by the primordial wave. And you will find out it's vanishing. It's absolutely negligible. That's what you, you have to do that calculation. You can't believe me unless you do that calculation. Okay, so that's number one. On the other hand, uh, and it's really a matter of not the philosophical matter that there isn't any radiation reaction. There is, but it's so small. That's the problem. It's You can imagine it, but you have to make the physical number to find out. Uh, if you find something different, please write me. I'd be very surprised. On the other hand, the other one, the first question is, is there radiation reaction involved in the primordial, when the black holes collide with each other? Is We know there is radiation reaction involved because they very often get a kick. In fact, the black hole pairs that we see often are moving at a very high velocity with respect to the galaxy in which they were initially formed. And that comes about, and that actually is shown in these numerical solutions. It has to do with, uh, the, the, it has to do with conversion of, 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 the, of the, the gravitational energy into linear momentum at, at some point in the process of the radiation occurring. And uh, that, by the way, you don't have to even think very hard. The numerical the relativity takes that into account right away. It, the, the numerical relativity covers that already. On the other hand, if you want to do it by post-Newtonian, a lot of people try to do the calculation with post-Newtonian par parameters, you have to go to very, very high order in V over C, I think 11th order in V over C, to get that effect. It's hard to do. So, it's, you need the numerical, I mean, if you want to do it without breaking your mind and keeping all the signs right, I, you, I think you better trust the general relativity uh, numerical calculation. So I don't, I don't think we do anything special. Numerical relativity does nothing special about separating it out, the, the advanced solution from the retarded solution, from the, all the different tricks we have, that how to deal with the radiation problem. It, it doesn't think about that. It just does it. And that that's the elegance of, and also the stupidity of numerical methods. Okay. 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 Thank you, Obro. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Professor Rainer Weiss, I mean, it's uh, now almost two hours of, yeah, I, of your I, lecture. I, I, <laughs> and I mean, uh, well, I mean, we cannot, we cannot find the words, I mean, to acknowledge 
uh, properly to your kindness of giving this wonderful webinar to us. But before we finish, I'll just ask everybody to turn on the microphones again to give a final round of applause and retribution to this wonderful Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, you asked that group asked some of the best questions I've ever had in any of these kind of lectures. So there's a lot of hot things going on in Brazil, let me tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. All the best. All the bye -bye. best to you. Bye bye. Bye bye.